Yes, uh, um, several questions. I'm trying to choose the more appropriate ones uh, for this uh, uh, session. So one question is, why did this start and continue in Germany in particular and not in other places as much? Any particular reason? This is probably Aditi. It says A, B, Aditi Benerjee. Yeah. Okay. So the reasons why it began in Germany, um, it did not in fact begin in Germany. The earliest people to translate the Bhagavad Gita and bring Indian text to Europe were obviously the British with people like um, William Jones, etc. France was a center for Indological studies or Oriental studies and the first generation of German scholars all went to France and learned Sanskrit there with the French experts. At some point, Germany takes over leadership for reasons that I've explained have to do with its own internal politics, its own internal religious identities, but also because it is now looking to forge an ancient um, sort of heritage for itself, where it looks to India and thinks that it can give it this Aryan identity and prove that its civilization is older and greater and more sophisticated and has a better formed language than the French do. The French is, of course, Catholic Latinate civilization. So it is looking to Rome. And the Germans are trying to oppose that with this new Aryan concept. So there is a nationalist interest there in, in the development of Indian studies. And the scale of investment um, that Germany undertakes is quite serious. I mean, within one generation, the French are nowhere on the scene, neither the British. The Germans are overproducing PhD so rapidly that they're exporting their people to Oxford, into the heart of the English shires. They're sending people with this ideology. And of course, to India, as I mentioned, let me show you a slide um, that actually shows the expansion of, um, here we go, the Sanskrit Reich expands. This is what happens where German scholars are rapidly placing their students all over the world, um, all across Europe, in fact, not just in Germany. So you see Breslau, uh, actually at that point it is part of Germany, but now it's in Poland. Uh, Königsberg, still part of Prussia, now uh, a Russian enclave, all the way to Bombay, Vienna, Strasbourg. So a huge expansion. This, this is only covering the expansion to German universities. But as you know, Max Müller goes to the UK. Um, Goldstücker, I mean, all the names you can think of are trained in Germany. Also America, Dwight Whitney and so on are learning German skills, German ideas of textual scholarship and are moving out and instituting these at home. So there's... Uh, stop share. Um, there is an interest there and it is well-funded and it's been a very powerful um, ideological expansion that has gone on. Okay, thank you, Joy. Uh, there are a couple of questions um, uh, from Bala Srinivasan. Did Hindu texts become a collateral damage in the fight between Protestants and Catholics and the followers were obliged to follow the thread to confirm? To confirm. Unambigu unambiguously so. I mean... Uh, you know, who reads these texts today in adherence to the tradition? And if you do, you are considered problematic. The next slideshow will show some, um, actually, since the question has come up, why don't we go to that and actually look at um, these comments? These comments are made even today. This is not something that Vishwa and I have taken up because it is simply of historical interest. Um, Anyone trying to read the text traditionally comes under renewed attack, uncritical, right-wing, fundamentalist, supporting a Brahminism, supporting a patriarchy, profiting from the text. If you look at the amount of donation that a Brahmana may have gotten 200 years back, these were impoverished people and you compare them with salaries in the professoriate, there is no comparison. And yet these criticisms of privilege, exploitation, wealth, authority, power, they are not applied to the present. And there's been a continuous sort of domination or exploitation of Indian textual traditions. So let me show you actually a slide with a quote. So you know that I'm not making this up. Um, this is actually things that they have said uh, here. I won't read it out. Or maybe Vishwa, can you read it out or Srinivas? 
I can read it out. Okay. The pundit's proficiency yeah. in a subject is often coupled with a certain way of life. And it may be difficult to divorce the academic aspect from the pundit identity. Since he's supposed not only to function as a mere scholar, his view of the culture he embodies through his erudition is necessarily more holistic. So that's why the pundit is a problem. Western Indology, with its specifically historically oriented critical approach, had to make use of Indian panditya not the word, had to make use of Indian Panditya in order to get as much as possible first-hand information, but it could not accept its, meaning Hinduism's or Panditya's, theological dimension without compromising the scientific aims as a historical subject. Since this in source of misunderstanding persists to date, it should be made clear that the Western approach is not to belittle Indian learning, but merely a methodological necessity. So apparently it is not belittling to say that it will not accept their theology or their presuppositions, but we will just take your text and do with it what we want. This is what is going on at Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute today. This is the model for it. So, uh, so I can, if you want me to take names, I will tell you names of scholars who collaborate in this way. They, they produce garbage work just to get themselves invited to Israel or Zurich uh, once in a while and so on. And here's a call. Okay, I, I won't say I, 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 I once uh, went to uh, Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute and I was talking to a very senior person there who was explaining to me that the Indian texts like Ramayana and Mahabharata have no contemporary relevance. They are of no use for the modern Indians and they need to be preserved, studied and examined purely from a historical curiosity perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, who was that person? I, somebody was asking in the chat who the person was because I heard exactly the same comment. Should I mention the name? Uh, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a person uh, by the name uh, Mr. Srikant Bahulkar. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let me say something. I... There is a problem here. Uh, the reason I wanted to not take names is it is an institutional problem. And there is no way to resolve this problem until we start asking why the institution itself is structured in a certain way. The slide I showed you is of a professor giving a lecture, speaking to an audience at an event organized by the Consulate General of India. Now the quote is not given at that conference. I don't know the speech he gave at that conference, but the quote was already in print and was accessible in writing. And this notion that the Consulate General has no better work to do than provide a platform for people historicizing the Indian tradition and saying there's no value to it, it has to just be extracted. Even if you're a Marxist, or especially if you're a Marxist, this notion of extraction and exploitation from the non-Western world to the Western world ought to be problematic. Okay, next question, yeah, please. I'd like to, yeah, I mean. yeah, there are some questions on uh, historicism. But uh, probably we could, uh, you know, ask them in the humanities uh, session. But there are a couple of questions, uh, you know, which relate to the the question of uh, how the texts are uh, you know, studied from a historical perspective. There is a question from Rao. He mm -hmm. says we have been a rather sh a sharp back and forth on a discussion list on the reading of the epics, mm -hmm. for example, the Ramayana or the Vedas, where scholars like Talagiri are pos positing that the only way we can find our way out of the Western Indological rabbit hole is to use their, that is Western tools to challenge their conclusions and thesis. Mm -hmm. For example, something like Aryan Invasion Theory. Mm -hmm. Talagiri takes a literal critical approach to the Ramayana and argues that the interpolations in the Ramayana are part of a project of scheming later authors mm -hmm. Uh, part of scheming later authors to justify certain social practices, right? Uh, which is the same similar kind of a take by Marxist and you know, critical scholars. 
any thoughts on the bhandarkar or telagiri kind of a projects about reading the epics and vedas and other texts so the, the, i think there are multiple issues here probably the last issue we can leave because you've already addressed that mm -hmm. but the other issue which is being asked is um is it what is your uh, comment on studying ramayana the vedas and the mahabharata in a similar fashion as the western indologists do to be able to um, you know invalidate their conclusions or thesis there is no look there is an invalidation you can do at the level of conclusions which is simply stating the inverse right so where they say black you say white where they say migration from the west you say migration from the east the methodology the approach to text the understanding of text is still western the texts are still seen as merely human creations with a history with an antiquity with a politics behind them and they are not seen as the way text should have been seen or were seen traditionally which would be that it is an element of the continuing revelation of hinduism I would like to say something. I would like to say something. Let me just say, again, this goes back to the opening debate we had about singularity, right? If you're going to reduce human beings to data of any kind, skin color, cranium measurements, DNA types, or whatever, they may have a technical aspect in Shastra, like, like, uh, Shastra for uh, studying um, health, health issues or so. But in the humanities, if we have reduced a human being to matter and to, to, to racial markers, then why are we even doing humanities? What is the point of doing humanities? There is, for example, if I may say so, Raja Dharma, which can take care of the politics, right? There is, for example, Ayurveda or any medicine which can take care of the body. And there is all this modern technology that can take care of desires that you did not even know you had. There are technologies to create new objects for desires and new desires. So why do we need humanities? We need humanities because we are interested in something being in understanding what the respect a human being has and to and to talk about and bring that out in contrast to the sciences, in contrast to the empirical, uh, to have a have a logos about the jiva. So, so by I, I'm sorry, I I just would not even go so far as to say that we have to continue or rebut or this episteme. This episteme has died. I mean, nobody, I mean, what migration theory is going to explain Europe and who's interested in it and why should we be interested in any migration theory that ex explains us? We should go back to our philosophical strong point. Our philosophical strong point is that we are the receivers of an outstanding revelation which did not occur just once, but after the four Vedas, it continued in the Panchama Veda. It gave birth to the Agamic Puranic tradition that is, that is throbbing and alive even to this day. And that is our strength, understanding that, understanding the commentarial tradition that goes with it, clarifying the arguments contained in it should be our primary goal. Thank you, Vishwa. Uh, I think... Uh, now the rest of the questions we can take uh, in the humanities uh, session. And I'd like to ask uh, uh, Professor Edward Butler to um, start the, the session, the next session, on uh, the crisis in the humanities. Um, is Krishnan going to speak? Yeah, I, I wanted to make a quick comment here. Um, so, Joy, can you put that quote up that you had there? The previous one? The previous one, yes. Okay. Let me just share screen. Uh, while this is happening, Krishnan so, has been a great friend of mine and has been, uh, you know, giving me support, emotional and otherwise, especially emotional because I, you know, some of the stuff is so 
poisonous, I just break down and cry. So uh, that's why I invited uh, Krishna. And I hope it did not throw anything for a loop because uh, I was talking to him yesterday and he said, I'd like to say something and I, I want him to. Thank you, Vishwa. So uh, this quote, it, it, it's a, a beautiful example of the smoke and mirrors approach. I'm a scientist and uh, I uh, am, am obviously, because of that, interested in questions of methodology. And I try to understand how we set up uh, experiments, how we design a query, and how that design of that query uh, dictates what answers we may or may not be able to find. And when I see this, there are two things he's claiming, um, which I think, uh, one, he's claiming that Western Indology has a method that is somehow superior to that of the Pandit. And this, I think, is the, is the bubble that uh, Vishwa's work and, and Joy's work has helped to burst. Um, they have, I think, marshaled so much evidence that this approach is neither scientific nor critical nor historical, lacks any objectivity at all. In fact, it is deeply embedded in a, in a theological, political, racist uh, discourse. And therefore, there is in fact no objectivity to that Western approach, none that I have been able to find. And I've been reading uh, in Indology for the best part of 30 or 35 years. And for me to encounter uh, Dr. Adluri and uh, Dr. Bakshi's writings, uh, first in the form of the knee signs, uh, then in the form of their examination of um, how the Bhagavad Gita, for example, there was a separate essay on how the Bhagavad Gita was cut and pasted by various Western scholars. Uh, it is so objectively done, so, so clearly written, that it leaves no doubt that the Western logical approach is, is not scientific, it's purely uh, subjective, and you can essentially come to any conclusion you want, uh, as long as you can write in uh, uh, very well uh, and, and nicely in a, in a Western language, whether that language be German or, or, or English. That seems to be the only criterion. And when they say, for example, that the only use of Indian scholarship, of Panditkim, is to be a native informer, that's really what he's saying here. We need these people as native informers to kind of translate the mumbo jumbo in the text. And, and after that, you know, we'll take care of it. You know, we'll take it to a higher level and talk about it in that way. Um, that obviously presupposes that uh, Indian commentators, and there's a huge commentarial tradition in many of the Shastras, uh, who might have commented on a text uh, 200 years after, 500 years after the text was composed, this is using their historical paradigm, uh, are missing the point entirely. But some um, uh, European or, or a privileged uh, white American person, uh, 2000 years later, sitting in a university, not culturally embedded, with no access to an oral tradition, none of those actually can form a better interpretation or a more correct interpretation. So all of those ideas, which, which I see all over the place in, in Indology and in uh, studies of India uh, are captured in this quote. So it's a very powerful quote. I mean, it's, it really uh, has all of that. I mean, of course, the quote doesn't say it, it's smoke and mirrors, but all of that is behind this quote. Uh, thank you, Krishna. Uh, I think uh, uh, we need to get started with the humanities uh, session, crisis and humanities. And I think um, you were going to read um, from the introduction of your book. Uh, and would we also be talking a little about historicism in this session? Because there are some questions on that and I'm not sure where we should uh, place those questions because the session after that is about Mahabharata. So my suggestion is Ed reads and uh, he actually has a segment from chapter seven that starts with historicism. So after he's done reading, if the historicism questions, you can direct them at him and he can read maybe from chapter seven or just explain chapter yeah. seven. On I also story. would like to first thank, I would, yeah, I would like to personally thank Krishna Ramaswamy 
uh, for for state going to that slide and stating our work in such a precise manner. Uh, maybe I should have copied it down, <laughs> or maybe you can email it to me. So if I'm uh, sending out a book proposal, I can put that on it. It was very well done, Krishna. Thank you. So, okay, and. Um, we need to uh, finish this session by uh, 7.30 so that uh, either the, the last session, we have some final uh, Q&A, you know, time for some final Q&A as well. So Ed, you can uh, time your reading based on that. We have half an hour for the whole session. Yes. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to read just a, uh, a, a brief passage from, uh, from my book on the nascience, um, the introduction. As inheritors of a civilization with an unsurpassed wealth of ancient texts, as well as a native tradition of commentary upon and inquiry into those texts of unsurpassed richness and diversity, the question of the nature and status of philology, the study of ancient writings in the modern world, would in any case be of importance to the self-understanding of contemporary Indians. But there are reasons why the study of Indian texts in the West holds a special concern and requires a special inquiry. This inquiry into the history and presuppositions of Indology, that branch of modern philology concerned with the Indian textual tradition, particularly as practiced for more than a century and a half in Germany, is the task of the nay science. German Indology, with its peculiar historical critical or text historical method, for many years successfully promoted itself as the cutting edge scientific investigation of India's intellectual legacy. The argument of the nay science, however, is that the purpose which has guided German Indology has actually been the delegitimation of the Indian commentarial tradition and the arrogation to itself of sole interpretive authority over India's sacred texts in the service of an ultimately theological agenda. The Ney science argues that the method informing modern German scholarship on India is rooted in neo-Protestant theology and that German Indologists claim to an objectivity and agnosticism that would render them superior to the indigenous Indian commentarial tradition depends upon obscuring German Indology's own theological and metaphysical commitments. The Ney science argues that German Indology has given itself the mission, not of understanding, but of philologically taming and purifying Indian texts. The sense of criticism in the historical critical method of German Indology derives specifically from the scriptural hermeneutics of 18th and 19th century Protestant theologians, such as J.S. Semler and F.C. Bauer, who sought to secure a firm ground for Christianity in the age of rationalism by separating the supposedly contingent, <clears throat> merely historical elements of scripture from the divinely inspired core within it. This purification of Christianity was to result in a religion freed from the contingent historical circumstances of its emergence, namely Judaism, and hence rendered universal and rational. This goal led these theologians to sacrifice whatever in scripture was construed as having been particular to the Jewish people for the sake of the universal truths that alone were salvific for humanity as a whole. The theological critical project drove a wedge, first between the Old and New Testaments, and then within the New Testament between allegedly Judaic and Pauline elements. Hence, Semler speaks of, quote, two completely opposed systems emerging from the contrast between Judaism and Pauline Christianity, the first embedded in an historical tradition, the latter, quote, imparted through the divine spirit. This dogmatic theological distinction provided a clear program for critical intervention in the Christian scriptures. However, its program also already suggested a more universal philological project through the notion of a progression or evolution of forms of religion from so-called heathenism or polytheism through, Juda through Judaic monotheism to Christianity as the so-called absolute religion in which having advanced, quote, from serfdom to freedom, from immaturity to maturity, 
from the youth of humanity to a period of adult ripeness, from the flesh to the spirit, man knows himself for the first time to be elevated into the element of the spirit and of spiritual life, his relationship to God, now the relationship of spirit to spirit. That's a quote from Bauer. This evolutionist conception of the history of religions, operating in the background for subsequent scholars, authorizes a critical interrogation of any text from any tradition whatsoever with respect to which elements in it are to be deemed as reaching forward and which backward on this continuum of resemblance to a rationalized Protestant Christianity. Accordingly, Adluri and Bagchi sometimes use the term supersession, originally refers to the doctrine that salvation in Christ replaces or supersedes God's covenant with the Jewish people, in a broadened sense to include its use against the Indian commentarial tradition. Here, supersessionism, quote, primarily took the form of a methodological supersessionism, though evangelical overtones were not absent, that was aided by the narrative that self-reflexivity and critical consciousness were both discoveries of the Enlightenment. The modern text historical critic, inheriting his method from supersessionist theologians, acquires in this way a quasi-religious function of mediating between the faithful and a text, the salvific value of which has been obscured, supposedly, by its history. The critic alone is in a position to determine what is essential and hence salvific in the text, even if salvation is now conceived in outwardly secular terms. The historical critical interpreter takes it as his task and his privilege to free texts from their specific historical situation and determine what in them contributes to the universal philological project. This universal project, however, remains ultimately Christian, rooted in the ongoing and never complete conquest of the West's own pre-Christian or pagan intellectual and spiritual heritage, proceeding through the critical purification of Christianity itself, which involves the intellectual and spiritual subordination of Judaism, as well as the Protestant critique of the Catholic tradition, and ultimately seeking to pass judgment on all of the competing global religions through the vehicle of an interventionist philology that would determine for the inheritors of these traditions what their own legacies can and should mean to them. The Ney science seeks to expose the religious agendas pursued by German Indologists in the outwardly secularized form of the study of religions or of the history of religions and the understanding of history that allowed historical inquiry to become a proxy for religious goals. Since the mode of doing scholarship informed by this neo-Protestant theological orientation spread from Germany to become international and has not only been applied to the study of Indian traditions, but in diverse ways to other ancient non-Western traditions as well, this inquiry has a wider relevance, which the present work, my book, will also attempt to bring forward. The text critical method, which originated in a reflex against rationalism in the attempt to insulate Christianity from becoming merely one tradition among the host of others, came to be mistaken for the ideal of enlightened, self-critical, and progressive scholarship. The investigation of Indology pursued in the Ney science is thus an essential step on the way to rethinking the task of the humanities. The promise held out by Adluri and Bagchi's critique is that the Indian tradition and other traditions, freed from the suspicion of requiring ratification from so-called scientific interpreters, may contribute through their flourishing to a new age of the human sciences genuinely international and multipolar, and informed not by a fragile, externally imposed ideal of scientificity, but by the deepest existential concerns embodied in the texts themselves. Thank you, Ed. Um, I, I have obviously read that uh, myself many times. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, many people here, that is the most succinct most insightful summary of the naissance. The naissance at about 450 pages is too long. Ed has written a wonderful 100-page book called Polytheism and Indology, Lessons from the Naissance, and we're trying to get it published. So 
Um, you know, everyone on this uh, talk should really be contacting publishers and saying, I'm going to buy a couple of copies by Christmas or by Diwali, and this needs to be in print because it is a fantastic work. It's very accessible. It's very lucid. And it is not simply, I know it's called Lessons from the Nay Science, but it's a lesson that actually goes beyond what is taught in the Nay Science because Ed is a very, very profound spokesperson for polytheism. And he is showing things that are just implicit in the Nay Science. And he is making a great defense of polytheism that I think, uh, you know, Hinduism, as, as he calls it, is the largest surviving polytheist tradition in the world. Um, not simply in terms of adherence, but in terms of practices, deities, you know, institutions, temples, everything. And it's, 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 I, I cannot think of a more important book that needs to be published. Srinivas, how are we doing for time? Yeah, we're okay. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about historicism. I think your argument about history um, has not, you know, been presented yet uh, in your presentation, you didn't talk about it. Probably mm -hmm. we have some time to talk about it. Uh, and also the domination of uh, history and history related um, uh, investigations uh, in the modern humanities and how the whole of humanities you know, has become a side note uh, in, on historical of historical studies could also be you know, uh, you know, discussed now, uh, probably this is a good time. And then I could ask the questions from the audience on historicism and history. So do you want to ask the question or you want me to lay out something right now? I, I, I think it's better if you lay out the argument first and then okay. we can get to the questions here. Yeah. So to do that most effectively, then I'm going to, this is the problem with inviting Srinivas. He follows our work too closely. And so he knows things that other audience members don't. And he knows the presentation I did yesterday. And so he's actually asking me to bring up some of that. Um, so I will just about four slides from that, but let me read Ed's statement of historicism from chapter seven. The Nay science reveals text critical Indology as a prime case of an historical consciousness demanding commitment to a single telos or goal of history, a consciousness that supersedes and replaces Indian or Japanese or Chinese or Europa consciousness. This singular historical consciousness effectively forecloses the possibility of multiple histories that would be rooted in the forms of these diverse cultures and that would reach forward towards goals peculiar to them, although there is nothing to prevent these histories and their goals from overlapping in important respects. Historical consciousness is not the same as an awareness of history. This is the first point that needs to be made. When we critique historical consciousness, we are not saying that we wish to be ahistorical. We are not saying that we cannot tell the difference between yesterday and today and tomorrow. Everyone can. There is not a culture in which people did not know that, that had no sense of passing time, did not know that their grandfathers or grandmothers did things differently than they do. There is no culture in which they thought, you know, we are statically doing what 2000 years ago Hinduism was. All cultures have an awareness of historical time. Yeah, we even if they do. In fact, if in, in some cultures, uh, it is the future that is deficient. So the future is not a well-defined mode of time. So, for example, in African religions, they have two kinds of time, the time of the ancestors and the time of now, Sasa Zamana. So uh, it is... Um, it, the future may be behind us. For more, most cultures, the future is behind, but the past is in front uh, for you to see. And it is nowhere more uh, beautifully expressed as in the worship of ancestors, where you are paying heed to a certain significant succession and a living connection to the past as historically uh, passed by. So this idea that history is, uh, uh, is something that the West invented and the Indians are deficient in it, or maybe the Africans is a ridiculous notion. What is deficient or, or what Indian thought refuses to do is to impose on this history some political idea of, uh, of 
of providence, divine providence that gives Europe the right to colonize the world uh, or to organize all people of the world as somehow primitive, uh, requiring the adult oversight of uh, a European uh, institution. So in this political domination, uh, the universities in Europe produced a logos. You go to anthropology, you, you immediately begin with uh, Margaret Mead and you know, all these uh, problematic persons. Uh, but the idea there is the arrangement of humans according to a scale. Returning again to my idea of singularity, that scale in Hinduism is illusory because a jiva can go back and forth on even if there was such a scale. Such a scale is not there, but there is a natural scale. For example, you can be born as a frog or a bird or another being. So that it's not so much whether you believe in the jiva or not. If you do, that's that's gr great, good, but the existence of such a paradigm in the text, which is sufficient to critique the historical ordering that we are asked to swallow, uh, raises the following question. What if I do not believe that Europe, Europeans are uh, providentially superior to all human beings? What if I do not believe that Europeans are the grown-ups in the room? What if I don't believe that they are infallibly scientific? Then the question is, uh, okay, what history were we talking about and who constructed them? So that is the thrust of our work here. Uh, the thrust of our work is not to show, look, I mean, the, these prejudices are so ingrained in us that even if Joy and I showed that they were wrong about this, this person was wrong about the Gita, that person was wrong about the Gita, people will say, yeah, sure, but still there could be somebody who, who would have been uh, who, who could have done it correctly. So the idea of progress. So the past may have been incorrect, but if we become more and more critically conscious and publish more and more papers, if we can s send more Western scholars to India and attach them to sufficiently submissive, servile informants at Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute, and they bring back and publish more work, then maybe we can perfect this. No, because what Joy and I have shown is that there has not been a single text historian of the Mahabharata in 200 years that ever came close to improving the method, refining the method. Every single, and that's the whole point, is if we had left one scholar alone, you could have argued that. Now the question is that the text historical method has consistently produced erroneous results for 200 years vis-a-vis -vis the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. Do we give the text historical method more time to work its magic? Come on. Come on. Even a placebo works more times in a drug trial than the text historical method. That's what I um, Srinivas, do I have time to do the four key slides on, on historicism or you want to go? Can, straight? You, can you, can you do it in 10 minutes? 10 minutes is doable. Okay. Okay. I think, I think, yeah, maybe you could. Yeah. All right. So let's do that. Um, this is from a, a presentation I did yesterday for the Hindu University of America. And it was a discussion on Aryanism and race and very topical issue. Um, but I'm only going to show you four slides of that because you should have been there yesterday. So I'm just going to take the, the notion of history here that is being, that 
we are fighting against is the reduction of time to a homogenous space, the reduction of narratives of experience to one encompassing narrative that corresponds to reality. So that all these sub narratives, as Ed mentioned, these Chinese experiences of history and these Yoruba narratives, they are now subsumed within this all encompassing one, which is true, which is objective, which relates to reality one to one simpliciter. It models reality as it really is. It is not culturally specific. And Jordi, all I'm not able to see your slides. So if you're I'm coming to the slide, don't worry. Okay. All these other narratives are peculiar modifications of the one true narrative. These people somehow could not relate to reality. They made up stuff. They posited things out there that were not out there. Gods, for instance, right? Whereas we are real. We have reality as it really is. And all these other experiences have to be pulled in here, fitted in like a mosaic into this world historical picture. And then the picture is complete. There's a quote by Lord John Morley. I will paraphrase, but you can look it up. In the past, people used to ask of something, is it true? We now ask, why did some people believe it to be true? Do you see the difference? Their beliefs now are just beliefs. There are some kind of, you have to explain it in terms like a freak aneurysm in the brain. Why did they believe this to be true? We don't ask of ourselves our experience of reality. Why do we believe this is true? That would be a philosophical question to say, you know, is there anything out there? Am I really experiencing reality as it is? No, I am normal and sane. Ancient cultures are diseased. They are the patients. We have to apply an analytic to them. We have to sit in the chair and listen to the patient and psychoanalytically explain your experience of reality is not real. You are suffering from a delusion. This is how reality is. Experience the truth. This reduction of history to one timeline has a specific antecedent. Yesterday's presentation was about all the transformations that happened. I cannot explain those today. I will show you only four slides. Um, let me go to sharing, share screen. So something happens to the experience of history through Christianity where multiple experiences of time, the histories of different notions are now subsumed into one large thing called history with a capital H which is defined by the salvific appearance of Christ and time now itself becomes homogenous. There are not many different times of many different cultures. All time now is one and it is defined as a before and an after. The before is before Christ. The after is Anno Domine in the year of our Lord. This experience of reducing time to one level is something that through various transformations continues in secular modernity. When people say, did it happen historically? Histories are multiple, stories are multiple, experiences of time are multiple. Right now in this conference call, I am only ever going to have my experience of time. All the 187 participants in this call are having their own experience of time. It takes an act of enormous hubris for me to reduce all those experiences and say, mine is the normative one, mine is the real one. All those are absorbed within this. But this is what happens. Time itself becomes homogenized. Not only does it become homogenized, but everything in time now has validity, has reality, has being insofar as it points to this event. Something that does not point to this event actually is irrelevant. So time itself has been homogenized. It has been given one direction, one meaning, one purpose. Things fit into this narrative, either as trivial and meaningless, which means they're actually ejected from this narrative, or they fit into this narrative in terms of pointing to the salvific history. And this is what, let me get out of the pointer now. 
this is what that experience looks like. St. John the Baptist, you saw the slide earlier, is pointing at the central figure of history, secular time itself, which early Christianity thought was covered with sin and death and was meaningless and experience of pain. It has been redeemed through the appearance of God in the form of Christ. And St. John the Baptist, you see the finger pointing to him, uh, to Christ, is pointing that truth. Secular history is not the truth. It is not the realization of God's plan. The realization of God's plan is accomplished through the descent of Christ into history to redeem history. In fact, to put an end to history. This notion which early Christianity has in modernity goes through several transformations. And instead of pointing to Christ, St. John the Baptist, the finger would be pointing towards now history itself as the meaning of history. This is not Christianity, by the way. It is derived from Christianity, but it is Christian only by derivation. Now, history itself becomes the total reality where God's plan is being revealed. And historical progress, material progress itself is the place that this greater redemptive truth is being shown. And that's uh, the next slide. Um, let me get out of the pointer. So through a series of derivations from the Judaic conception of history, through the Christian one, that time has been fulfilled, to the modern notion that time is yet to be fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled through secular materialist progress. Um, this is sort of the, the Marxist uh, Ideal. Here you have the sickle and the hammer, the workers are united and triumphant, the brotherhood of man is accomplished. This is no longer the Christian kingdom of God, which is A, in the future, and B, not within secular time. The individual faithful exits secular time to realize that paradisiac state. But that has now been brought down in secular modernity and we all participate in it here and now. History now gets a density that it previously did not have. When people say, did something happen historically, they mean, did it happen on this secularized version of the Christian timeline? That's uh, three of the slides. Let me go back and show you the final one, the one we are concerned with, how that plays into a certain narrative of Indology is the completion of Indian traditions, um, the, the completion of the thought process of ancient uh, traditions. Let me exit and go to those final slides and show you those two. Um, start the share again. While I do this, while he does that, I would like to answer a question as to what is the validity of these claims that, that about Jesus or about God, about Sinai or in any religion? Well, all religions have revelation and there's no external evidence for it. It is the it is a ethical uh, relationship that exists between uh, transcendence as a community experiences it. And uh, so so there are I mean, there is the Judeo Christian revelation. There's also a Hindu revelation and which is the Veda. And it would be unwise to grant that um, there is only one revelation and other other revelations are merely historically cogitated mumbo jumbo and if christianity and judaism cannot grant that uh, the veda are revelation they lose the ability to posit their own revelation okay shall i continue Am I sharing? Yes, okay, great. So this is the part at which science engages with this bigger picture that we've been trying to give you today. Why the emphasis on history? Indologists derive legitimacy from it. The historical narrative as constructed culminates in the European present. European scholars are now in the position of rendering judgment on other uh, cultures. Um, the final point is a whole series of quotes that, uh, you know, were done yesterday. I won't uh, go back into those. But if you want to see what this looks like in programmatic terms, this is what it would look like. This is Heinrich von Stietenkran being given, uh, I think it's a Padma Bhushan or Padma Vibhushan, also $20,000 by the President of India. 
from a country that has no shortage of Sanskritists and certainly no shortage of barefoot students, uh, you know, kids going to school without. And yet it saw fit to give $20,000 to someone merely for learning its language and merely for giving it a space within this world historical timeline. So without his introduction, his induction of India into this timeline, India would not find itself in this timeline. It would not see itself. It would not be recognized. You see how that leveling of timelines and saying this is the only timeline. This is history. Everything that happens outside this is not historical i.e. is not real. You do not exist except in virtue of appearing within this historical space that we've created. Not only must you appear within this historical space, you must appear in the terms we tell you. You must appear in the position that we assign you. And that's the next slide. This is what the manufacturing of a the manufacture of a historical timeline, the assigning of cultures, a position on that timeline looks like. It begins with not just looking at Indian culture going back 2000 years. It goes all the way back to the paleological sciences. There has been a manufactured thing called history all the disciplines of the humanities insofar as their historical sciences now have contributed to the creation of this timeline, thereby giving it a reality, endowing it with a reality. When people ask, did this event happen? They mean, did it happen within this story that has been told? This, by the way, you can scientize it as much as you like. You can create as much research as you like. It is a story. It cannot be validated. It is an act of pure faith, analogous to the faith in the appearance of Christ, that this individual is God. This is a matter of pure faith. It cannot be legitimated. We now take the modern secular conception of history as the antithesis to faith. It is not. It is the modern descendant of faith. And I will end there. I have some wonderful quotes I might read if there are questions, but these were the slides from yesterday I wanted to share with you. Okay. Uh, so there's one question uh, from Rajat Vasudeva Murthy. So he's asking the Puranas are required to have Sarga, Pratisarga, Vamsha, Manvantara, and uh, Vamsanucharit. So how is this different uh, from uh, history and historicism? What is the purpose of these uh, five concepts in the Purana? I'm going to redirect this to Vish because this is his uh, great love is for the Puranas and the, their notions of time. So yeah, ask. and uh, there is an article, an interview that we did. So uh, just understand, for example, that this is all what Joy just said was history is a kind of a construct, right? Well. This and that there is a different perspective from which every narrative has to have a perspective according to which it is told. So, in the Purana, teaching of Dharma is the perspective from which past material is reorganized. This is number one. Now, that so looking at the Purana as teaching Dharma and you and repurposing those historical details no longer as just material events but events whose significance consists in dharma is called itihasa or itihasa purana now amara kosha gives this definition purana pancha lakshana i don't know why amara kosha does this but western scholars took that and said purana pancha lakshana and careful and Hakar tried to see which Purana had these five. Some Purana, many Puranas don't have these five. Bhagavata Purana has over 11 such sections or such themes. So they tried to construct an Ur Purana, which has been lost to, apparently to Hindus, and careful tried to construct that Ur Purana. Meanwhile, what Puranas we have 
because they're not the Ur Purana. Do you see where we are going with this? Are all degenerate texts. So why don't we teach Indians to identify what is earlier and what is later so that at least some order according to this Western principle of degeneracy. See, the, in, it's not just that the Europeans are on the path of progress. The obverse of it is that other people have been on the path of anti-progress or degeneracy. So by showing that everything is an interpolation, by showing that Puranic people don't really know the Veda, you are slicing a living culture, chopping it uh, limb by limb. And that is very cruel. And uh, the common Western view is you go to a child and say, why are you worshiping Ganesha? Can there be a God? Is it mythology or is it? Imagine the, the cruelty, the, the absolute violence of expecting some kid who's probably just going to major in math and make a contribution, get married and die. Imagine having that kid having to justify the Veda having to justify the Upanishads, having to just and say, oh, there is Hindutva right now and you are bad about it. How, how can you do that to a kid? So this historicism is violent. It's unethical. It is an underhanded theology. And it is just a very shady thing to do to another human being. Can I... Should I ask you a fresh question or should I say something more? No, please, please add. Okay. Very powerful words from Vishwa and I'd definitely like you to say something more. Okay. So I'm actually going to read you something about the, the audacity of this move of leveling all time to one experience. And these are not my words, but I think worth reading out. The Christian claim that the whole and only meaning of history before and after Christ rests on the historical appearance of Jesus Christ is a claim so strange, stupendous and radical that it could not and cannot but contradict and upset the normal historical consciousness of ancient and modern times. To a classical mind like Celsus's, the Christian claim is ridiculously pretentious because it endows an insignificant group of Jews and Christians with cosmic relevance. To a modern mind like Voltaire, it is equally ridiculous because it exempts a particular history of salvation and revelation from the profane and general history of civilization. Both Celsus and Voltaire realized the scandalon of a history of salvation. This is um, Lewitt, who writes brilliantly on meaning and history. This leveling of historical time to one experience is so, as he says, is so strange and stupendous that in some sense, historical cultures, different cultures have not recovered from it. They have not been able to do it because it is unforeseen that anyone would even make this move on them. And so my analogy for it is often to say that we all have doors at our home and we are prepared for things like someone knocking or ringing the doorbell. And if, you know, if they say, can we come in, we might open it. If they say uh, we're suspicious or skeptical, we'll open just the bolt and look out a little and so on. No culture was prepared for this kind of incursion. If someone opens fire on your front door with a cannon, you cannot say my defenses were inadequate, my culture was decadent, my family was weak. No culture was prepared for this. So one of the things that Vishwan have been trying to do in critiquing this leveling what Ed calls the monotheistic reduction is to say the notion of the degeneracy of Hinduism, that all of India and multiple nationalities within India, multiple states, uh, multiple kingdoms within India, they would all degenerate. All of Africa, all the thousands and thousands of tribal entities in Africa were also degenerate, as was the new world. This is a ridiculous proposition. It cannot be maintained. What has happened is a move has been played that no culture anticipated 
and we are still struggling with the attempt to free ourselves from this homogenization of experience that modernity as the successor to Christianity has done. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jai. It was very well put. Um, so my purpose of uh, raising this is accomplished extraordinarily. I'm very happy. <laughs> Uh, so there is one question I'd like to ask before we move on to the next session. Uh, so this question is from Gaurav Shore. Um, he's from SPA. I know you have, so uh, Joy studied at SPA for a year uh, before he moved on to philosophy. And my daughter studied at SPA as well right now. So, you know, I, I'm, I've selected this question for that reason. The question is very interesting. Uh, I, let me read it out. It says, I have a keen interest on the implications of Adluri and Bakchi's work in the field of architecture and construction as seen today. In a small research study at the SPA, New Delhi, our students worked on the impact of the understanding of aspects of death and time on the degree of permanence as we wish to see in our built environment today. We build in concrete and steel and we mostly aren't aware of the interpretation and resultant fear of time and death uh, has a very real impact on the environment of cities that follow Western architectural paradigms as we see today. I would request Professor Adluria or Professor Bhakji to share their views on such applications, if we may use that term of philosophy in the world today. Also, could you comment on Weizenshong of the lack of need for balance between architecture and ecology, the built and the unbuilt, and our lust to build more and destroy more of nature is a clear win, if we might use that term, of the appreciation of the deep connection between the natural environment and philosophical understanding and religious practices. Um, I'm going to take that, take it as a question directed to me. Um, we actually had a wonderful panel on this issue of ecology and indigenous cultures, also organized by Indic Academy, at which Ed also spoke, Vishwa and I spoke, dealing with modern technology. Part of this, it's not the biblical narrative. I, I introduce you, the, the Christian slide you to show you its antecedents, but a huge set of transformations happens that makes it the modern narrative. But part of that modern narrative is to look at cultures and say, did they develop high rise buildings? Did they develop um, you know, high speed trains? Did they develop a highway network? These become the criteria of progress. And every civilization is seen as preliminary to this process and naturally overcome and superseded because they did not come to this level. This is a parochial view of history. It is the result of an abbreviation because we forget that our present day, it is, it is the conqueror's view of history, the triumphalist view at the back, looking back, saying this is what history was leading up to. It is parochial because this could all be gone within 100 years. We have no evidence that our civilizations, our empires will last longer than any before them. The only thing we can be sure of is that while they lasted, they did more damage to the earth and exploited each other far more than any civilization in human history before, that they killed far more people. If you think of the casualties in World War II alone, um, the potential for destruction we discovered is deadly. It has never before happened in human history. So this timeline that says all cultures that did not develop architecture and technology in our modern forms are therefore primitive, therefore overcome, therefore have to play catch up, is idiotic. And the reason it is idiotic is because these cultures answered the question of why and for what one should live far better than we did. We have not answered that question. Hinduism saw that there is one purpose and one purpose to life only is the accomplishment of one's duties and the accomplishment of liberation for the individual soul. Early Christianity had the same notion. Historical time is not where your salvation is enacted, Christ appears to end historical time and to point to that exit individually, the faithful exit, obviously as a community also, but they do not stay around here trying to fix the Near East politics, right? That would not be early Christianity at all. That is the modern transformation we have. So in a sense, all ancient cultures, and I do not accept Christianity from this, 
answer the question of what human life is for, what its ultimate aims are, better than we did. And if you think of Indian thought, it is consistently critical of architecture. I'm sorry to say this, but um, <laughs> you know, as, as someone who was at SPA for two, two months, not a year, Srinivas, and two, two months I got bored. Um, if you think of the myth of Tripura, right? The architectural fashioning of the universe is already seen as an alienation, alienation from, from divinity. In its first step already, Brahma creates the universe that is a made object. The universe itself is an architectural creation. Sometimes it's Brahma, sometimes it's Vishwakarma, the world architect. That is already the first alienation. Now come further alienations. Those who are Asuric want the permanence and the stability of the city, the Pura. And in the form of the Tripura myth, there's a huge critique of that notion of stability, permanency. And what is happening within those cities? It's not Rishi sitting down to meditate. It is, in fact, the maximization of human pleasure. So the urban built environment and its technology serves that kind of materialist living. Same thing repeats in the Ramayana story today. Ayodhya is not described in the architectural terms that Lanka is. And uh, by the way, whom are you supposed to follow when you go through Lanka? So within that entire city of beautiful, bejeweled people on chariots and all those wonders that um, Hanuman sees, he's completely lost initially. And he looks at every beautiful woman and says, this must be Sita and this must be Sita and so on. And finally, the thought comes to him that, you know, would Sita here having lost Rama, would, would she be, you know, in this state of pleasure and distraction? And then he finds the one person in that beautiful Pura who is crying and saying, I have lost something. That is the person to follow. So that becomes the exit out of the technological. And so also in philosophy, against all this optimism of history, look for that one person who is saying, none of this will ever equate to what I have lost. And that will be the exit.